So welcome to uh, my first talk of 2021. I'm Nigel Hicks, a, a professional photographer in the southwest of England. And tonight I'm going to be talking about focus, the third critical component of successful photography, as I hope you can see on the screen there. And um, I call it the, the third critical component because it's a bit of a holy trinity, the other two members of that holy trinity being composition and lighting. And it really uh, doesn't matter whether how good your your composition is or your lighting is, if the image is not focused correctly, then uh, it won't be a good picture. And likewise, it doesn't matter how well you're focused, if the composition or the lighting are no good, then again, you won't have a great picture. So it's, the three of them together make a bit of a holy trinity, which uh, have to come together in any image that you make, have a chance of making a really good photo. So that's really the talk, uh, the subject of tonight's talk is, is about how to go about making the, the right focus. Because it may seem blindingly obvious to say that your subject needs to be sharp, or sharply in focus. Um, but actually, of course, the whole thing about focus is a lot more than just that, than just getting your subject sharp. You need to be able to also think about the, the rest of the picture. So does the whole picture need to be sharp, not just the subject, but everything? Or is it just a question of having quite a narrow band in the picture sharp and everything else blurred? Now obviously this picture of this lovely little roe deer here taken in, in Cornwall a year or two ago is an example of the latter where really the focus is just on the deer's face and everything else, all the grass around it is completely blurred so your attention really focuses in quite literally on, on that deer's face and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about is uh, how you control the focus in your pictures to see, uh, to create the kind of image that you want to have. So that the first two slides I'm going to show you are just bullet points which, which I know it's a bit boring but we'll get on to the pictures in a moment just really to summarize what I'm going to show you in the following pictures so I say it's not just about getting the subject sharp what about the rest of the image and you guys can think about does the picture need to be sharp all the way from the foreground all the way to the horizon as is typical in much of landscape photography or for example do we need to blur everything behind the subject have the subject sharp and have everything behind it completely blurred so that the subject pops out from the background uh, and, and it, which is sort of the kind of thing you often do in portraiture and almost always do in macro photography and then there's selective focus which is what I just showed you that deer really where everything both in front of and behind the, the, uh, the, the subject is blurred and it tends to direct attention purely to that to just the one part of the picture where the subject is and everything else is, is out of focus. A further one you might come across, which perhaps is rather rarer, is you have a sharp background, and, that's, and the background is where the subject is, but the foreground is blurred, and that may be in a situation where you're trying to soften or hide some rather, something rather unsightly in the foreground, for example. But that, I think that's probably a, a less common kind of thing that you might do. And then finally, there's really the subject of blurred motion. So if you've got something that your subject is actually moving in the shot, then uh, it's is that going to be blurred because it's out of focus or blurred because it's moving? Obviously, even if it's moving and it's blurred because it's moving, it still needs to be sharp. So if you end up with something like a, uh, a, a sharp blur, if that makes sense. And uh, uh, if it doesn't make sense, then hopefully it will by the end, end of this talk. Anyway, so all these ideas about controlling the, the focus and how much of the picture is sharp is achieved through the control of depth of field. That is the amount of the image that is, that is sharp. So the amount of image from uh, the nearest point in front of the camera all the way to uh, the furthest point that goes out of focus uh, behind the subject. And the second uh, list of points here I've got control how we do we, how do we go about controlling the depth of field. Now the first two points I have here are probably the, the most important and just to bear in mind that wide angle lenses tend to naturally have a much bigger depth of field than telephoto lenses so that's one way to, to control your depth of field is choose the appropriate lens. And the second way is lens aperture, a high F number, a sort of narrow lens aperture, as in a high F number or high number, uh, has a much bigger depth of field than, than a wide open lens, so a low F number or low, uh, um, for example, 5.6, or so wide open aperture. So if you use a wide angle lens with a narrow lens aperture, then you'll end up with the whole view being sharp. And that's frequently what we do in landscape photography, as I mentioned before. If on the other hand you use a telephoto lens with a wide open aperture, you'll end up with a small depth of field. And that again is the kind of thing that you might have it with portraiture. Now when um, 
you cut start to come in close, the, the, the depth of field that you get with any particular lens and any given uh, lens aperture starts to decrease. So if you come in, say, perhaps less than 10 meters, then your depth of field will start to decrease for any given lens and any, any given lens aperture, uh, which obviously has a big impact on, on the way you focus the picture. And certainly, when it comes to macro photography or extreme close-up photography, that has a major impact because by the time you get down to focusing on something that's only a few centimeters away, such as a butterfly and so on, your depth of field is absolutely tiny, often only a few millimeters. And then so, so then focusing becomes really critical. And finally, the final point at the bottom is when you're focusing on a subject, the, the, the main point of sharpness um, hopefully will be on your subject, but then the focus will, will the area that is still in focus will also be somewhat in front of the subject and then also behind the subject. But the area that is behind the subject that remains in focus is generally greater than the area in front. So you may only have, so in terms of your depth of field, a third of it may well be in front of your subject and two, or where the main focal point is, and two thirds of your depth of field will be behind that focal point. So that's an important thing to consider when you're actually working out the best place to to focus your focus the lens and putting your subject within within that focus, that depth of field. So you cho you choose your lens. You should, you should be choosing your lens and aperture not so much for the light to, for the lighting conditions in order to just get get a, sh a, sh a sharp a shot that is reasonably sharp, but also in order to fit the right fit the kind of subject that you're shooting and to achieve the kind of effect that you're trying to get, whether it's a shallow depth of field or a big depth of field. So now let's move on and take a look at a few photographs that uh, sort of illustrate some of these points. I'll start off with some, some landscape photography. And here you'll see this is a snowy scene on Exmoor taken a couple of years ago. You'll see that this picture is sharp all the way from right in front of the camera. You see the footprints and the snow and the grasses and so on, all sharp all the way to, her, to the horizon. It's very sharp in, on, all the way to the back here. And also the clouds are still sharp as well. So this is a, a picture taken I say uh, with wide angle lens and with a narrow lens aperture, it's actually f11, so not huge, not incredibly sharp. I could have gone, uh, not incredibly, not an incredibly small depth of field. I mean, oh, let me start again. Not an incredibly narrow lens aperture, uh, but nevertheless uh, small enough in order to get a big depth of field all the way from the front of me all the way to the horizon. And similarly with this picture of St Michael's Mount in Cornwall. Uh, again, everything's sharp all the way from the cobbles right in front of me, all the way to the mount in the, in the distance. This is um, f22, so a very narrow lens aperture, and it has enabled me to get the picture sharp all the way through. Um, and that's given me a great, a huge depth of field and, and a great way of leading the eye into the picture from these cobbles to the mount. And that's given me, if, if either part of the picture was, was blurred, I don't think the picture would work terribly well. But of course, this kind of situation, or this kind of method of using wide angle shot with a narrow lens aperture to get a big depth of field is not just for landscapes. You might also use it for uh, events, as, you, as we have here. Uh, this is, shows the Bristol Balloon Fiesta, uh, taken a couple of years ago again. And uh, here, of course, I'm fo focusing really on the big balloons in the foreground, but with a big depth of field, I'm able to get this balloon all the way up here, nice and sharp as well. And the, the um, lens aperture there is f14, so it's giving me a nice depth, nice depth of field. That lens up, the lens itself is a sort of 17 to 40 mil lens at about 20 mil wide, so a uh, nice wide angle lens, giving me a, a nice sort of structure of the picture and a big depth of field, so everything is sharp. Similarly, with interiors, if you're taking pictures, wide pictures to show a whole room, you will need to use a high f number so a narrow narrow lens aperture to get a big depth of field to get the whole room sharp may not be quite quite the case if you're shooting details then you might well want to actually uh, have the lens a little bit wider open to actually give a smaller depth of field but if you're photographing the whole room you're going to use a wide angle lens and you're going to want to use a narrow uh, a big depth of field so a narrow lens aperture uh, as in this one this is actually f11 again so not an incredibly Narrow, um, narrow lens aperture. It could be, it could be smaller, but it's small enough to actually get the whole of this room sharp, from right in front of me all the way through to the to the kitchen in the background. And then also some people photography 
we wouldn't really call this portraiture as such, but uh, if it's either an event photography, might say, or documentary or reportage kind of shot taken at uh, Honiton Agricultural Show a couple of years ago, just sort of pictures of people in their environment and sort of giving me sharpness all the way through, more or less all the way through from this man in the foreground all the way through to the people in the background and really um, not just a shot of the people, but really setting the scene and showing me their environment and the kind of uh, thing that they do. So this again is an F14, so a nice big depth of field is created using, using that. And then we come to portraiture itself, when, the actual, when you're actually really homing in on someone's face and really they are sort of the subject. Then you're going to be using a telephoto lens, it's taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and a, fo a focal, I'm sorry, an a a aperture of F4, so the lens is wide open, so the background is completely blurred and uh, this is my partner, PP. Her face is sort of popping right out of the picture, and so dominantly, there's no competition from behind. But if you look at the picture, the depth of field is tiny. Her, fa her face is completely sharp, and the hair on the top of her head is completely sharp. But by, by the time you come around to the back of her head, that the hair is already blurring out, and, and in her neck as well, it's blurring out. So it's a very narrow depth of field, really focusing just on the face. And it, this, um, when you Focusing on people and also when you're focus, focusing on animals as well, always focus on the eyes because uh, we're programmed to look at people's eyes and that's where your attention will go. So if, any, if you can manage to get one part of a person's face really sharp, it's got to be the eyes. Same sort of thing with wildlife as well. Focus on the eyes, narrow depth of fields with a wide open aperture. This is F5. This one it shows a really a rather cute and fluffy juvenile Philippine uh, scops owl photographed. Uh, this is not a distant wildlife shot, this is quite a close-up one because this uh, little fellow was uh, temporarily held captive because he'd fallen out of his nest so someone was looking after him while he, while he actually grew up a little bit before he could uh, then fly off. So uh, quite fair, I'm fairly close to him, just a few meters away, using a short telephoto lens and using a telephoto lens in order with the, with the wide open lens aperture to actually blur the, blur the background so you can actually really get that, get the bird popping out. And you see the, the lens aperture, so the depth of field is incredibly narrow. Although the face is completely sharp, the feathers at the bottom here are already starting to blur out. So it's it really got a very narrow depth of field here. Of course, there are some situations where you are going to have to use a, a telephoto lens. You don't have the choice of, of well, should I use a wide angle or should I use a telephoto? Obviously, wildlife is one of those situations. But the other situation is sports, where you rarely get really that close to the action. So here with this uh, sailing picture, just using a 400 mil lens uh, coming in on these guys sailing is F8. So it's a moderately wide lens aperture, not hugely so. But with this shot, got uh, it's a fa quite a fast shutter speed, 640th per second, because they're moving quite quickly through the water. But I've got, got the lens after reasonably wide open so that everything ahead of them is blurred, so they really pop out. And also the, the water that's between me and them as well. It's, 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 the water immediately behind the boat is still sharp, but the water close to me is blurred. So, the, the, so with the water behind them or ahead of the boat, I'm really managing to concentrate attention on these fellas as they're, as they're sailing. Similar, similar sort of thing with uh, show jumping, this shots. There, there is no, no foreground to decide whether that should be blurred or not, but certainly the background is blurring out. I have to say, have to say actually, I would probably prefer the background to be even a bit more blurred than it already is. Um, but uh, this is F8, so yes, not, not as wide open an aperture as it could be, but moderately so. Uh, with a very fast shutter speed, a thousandth of a second, this horse, of course, is moving pretty fast. So I need to use quite a fast shutter speed to really capture the action. But also, say, concentrating really on getting not getting the horse sharp and the right, its right as well, of course, and then the blurring out the background. And then we come to macro photography. First of all, insects, lovely little butterfly photographed in Cornwall. And... I'm really just a, just maybe 20 centimeters away from this butterfly, so just homing in just on that butterfly, and the background is completely blurred. You can see that the depth of field is absolutely tiny. You can see that from the uh, from the antennae. They really uh, go out of focus very quickly as they come away from the uh, from the butterfly's head. This is actually f 7.1, so it's not it's quite a wide open aperture, certainly by 
the standard is often used in macro photography, but uh, it's not as, as narrow as I often would get. And I think it probably was a fairly windy day, so I had to use a moderately fast shutter speed in order to make sure I of course, uh, got the uh, butterfly sharp. One of the great things about macro photography, because the focusing is so critical, you have to really make sure that the camera is absolutely at right angles to the butterfly so that you get the whole wing and the head sharp. If, you, if your lens is at just even a fairly small, different angle from 90 degrees to the butterfly, then we'd have a situation where you got one part of the butterfly sharp and the other and the rest of it blurred. And that would uh, not work quite so well. So have the lens really completely at right angles to the butterfly's wings, and then you've got a good chance of getting the whole body from the head to the bottom of the wings sharp, and that's as, as we have here. Similar sort of thing in flower photography. Uh, the, these are really small flowers, about the size of my of my thumbnail, uh, sand pansies. Coming in really close, and the background is completely blurred out, um, even though this is f16, so very narrow lens aperture. You see that the depth of field is absolutely tiny. It's big enough to make sure that I got both flowers sharp, which is actually quite an achievement, really, when you're coming in this close to something. But uh, nevertheless, everything behind them is completely blurred, which is uh, really, uh, really rather uh, um, effective, I'm saying. Then we come on to the next thing, which uh, uh, taken in a pub. Remember those those places from long ago when we used to be able to go to pubs? Uh, really, again, a very narrow depth of fields. F4, so, the, so we're really focusing just in on the beer glasses and the pump and everything around it is blurred. So we've really directed attention to the beer and to the glasses. Background is completely blurred out and so even so is, so is the man, and even including partly his hand as well. So this is all quite secondary to the subject of the picture where really the concentration is just on the glasses and the, and, and the beer pump as well. So similar kind of thing coming up. Uh, a music festival, another thing to remember from the past. Again, just homing in on a very small part of the picture, just the, the mobile phone here, and the, or to some extent this person's arm springing up here, but actually this is actually starting to blur out already. Just a, we've got a very narrow band of the picture, which is sharp, which is these phones and the back of a couple of heads. Everything else is blurring out, so our attention is really concentrated onto this mobile phone here. Every, and this is actually, where was this? This was in Newquay, actually, a couple of years ago when George Ezra was playing. So it was quite a popular concert, that was. Uh, then move on to back to animals again and really homing in just on the eye of this Icelandic pony. Narrow, uh, um, narrow depth of field, lens aperture wide open at f4. Uh, so really, the focus really is just on the eye. Now, we've got in front of the eye, some area is a little bit sharp, this part of the forehead is sharp, but when we go behind the eye, immediately behind the eye, the focus really starts to go. And so your concentration really comes in onto this eye, to some extent onto the hair above the eye, but really the eye is very much the center of the picture. And that's really is very much where your attention, uh, where I want to draw your attention to actually the picture to actually uh, create that nice composition there. And then we come on to blurred movement, whether it be the subject or actually as the background. And I start off really with blurred moving water. And in the first shot, we've got blurred moving water in the background. The actual subject obviously is, is these autumnal leaves. And because the water in the background is, is actually just the background, it doesn't really matter too much whether it's out of focus or not. But it's blurred anyway with the with the movement, so that works quite nicely. Actually, it, it, in fact, it's come out quite sharp because we've got a f16, so there's quite a big depth of field, and the water's come out reasonably sharp, even and it, but with blurred movement. But it doesn't really matter too much one way or the other whether it's sharp or not because it is just the background. However, when you've got the water as actually the subject, it's blurred motion. It's the, but it's a subject, so it really has to be sharp. And even though it's blurred, it has lots and lots of lines in it, and those lines really need to be pin sharp. So we really got a nice pin sharp shot all the way through here. This is uh, f22, so big depth of field, and managed to get it sharp all the way through, actually, pretty much from from just in front of the camera, almost to the back of the back of the, of the shot as well. So just because you've got blurred move, movement doesn't mean to say it's okay to have the picture a little bit out of focus. It's, it's not because you still have these lines and they need to be sharp. 
So that's uh, often, that's going to be the case with, with moving water. With other movements, other blurred movements, it's still the same. So here we've got uh, traffic moving at night. Uh, so the head, so the, the tail lights of traffic in Shanghai, and a shot taken uh, f10 at 13 seconds, and the fo it's focused so that the lights are completely sharp. But again, if these lights were blurred, it really would not work. You need, need to have these lights completely sharp, and it's the lines that are sharp. Of course, the movement itself is blurred, but you still need to have the picture strongly in focus. Okay, so the remaining shots are actually going to be ones where I've done a few tests to, just to show to you uh, just uh, how you can change the focus and how it can be really wrong, right or wrong, depending on what you do. Or well, sometimes it doesn't matter too much. Sometimes it's a, it's a question of choices, I suppose. This shot, first of all, a wide angle landscape taken on the Timber Seafront in, on the south coast of Devon shortly before it got dark, so it's taken at dusk. So this shot is taken at f22, so a big depth of field. I've taken the, the lens off manual, fo oh, sorry, I've taken the lens off autofocus and put it on manual focus, and I focused it somewhere between these first two posts, so about three and a half meters away from me, four meters, to, so about 12 feet or so, 11 to 12 feet in front of the in front of the camera, focusing between these two posts. And I know that if I'm shooting at f22 and I put the camera's focus at that, at that sort of position that I know that everything will be sharp from just in front of the camera all the way to the horizon. And that distance where you can focus the camera manually, keep, keep, the, keep the camera's focus there, use a very narrow lens aperture and be assured of having the picture sharp all the way from the front of the picture all the way through to the horizon. That's called the hyperfocal distance where you might actually hear that talked about quite a bit in, in photography magazines. You can actually calculate this from a formula where, where your hyperfocal distance should be for a particular lens or different particular focal length anyway, at a different lens, particular lens aperture. But really, you're not going to. I can't. I'm not going to bother you with the, with the calculation because something I can't remember it myself at the moment. But also, when you're out in the field, you're freezing cold. It's getting dark. You're not going to bother yourself with, it, with that calculation, especially as your lens barrel almost certainly doesn't have most of the distances marked on it. And anyway moving on that lens barrel from say three meters to infinity is le probably less than half a turn probably only a quarter of a turn of the of the lens barrel so it's not usually so critical you're much better off just doing some experiments with your own lenses to see where that hyperfocal distance is for each of your lenses at at a le narrow lens aperture so you just work out if you for example in this situation if you put the if you manually focus the lens at about three and a half to four meters in front of you then you know that everything from right in front of the camera all the way to the horizon is going to be sharp as we have here so this first post is completely sharp as, as woodwork here is and all the way to the to the post in the distance and even the ship on the horizon are all quite sharp however if you then go to um, f4 so with the lens aperture wide open and you focus the, the, camp, the lens on this first post, then everything become, everything else is blurred. You can see it really doesn't work very well. It's not a great shot. This is not the sort of thing you want to come up with on, in, a, in a landscape photograph very often. It's the depth of field is really way too shallow. And that's the result of using F4 lens wide open and focusing on the subject that's close to the camera. On the other hand, if you do the same thing, F4, and then focus on the post in the distance. Now the post that's close by is blurred, and um, that's really not ideal either. It, it has actually worked better than I expected it to, in the sense that not only is, is the post where I focused uh, sharp, but actually it's sharp all the way up to just to the second post. Uh, and that's actually so it's not quite as bad as I expected it to be. So you can get quite a big depth of field at f4 if you're, fo if you're focusing into the distance at infinity, but then you're not going to get the sharpness coming up close to the camera. And this is the kind of shot where I think it would only work if, if you've got everything sharp, as I showed you in the first picture in the sequence. So F4, so this kind of the lesson here is don't be lazy. When you re, re, get to a shot like view like this and you want to shoot it, it's getting dark. You hold your camera up and say, oh, it's going to be F4. I can't be bothered. I can't bother with the tripod. Uh, 
you, you could be fairly sure that the picture you're going to get is not going to be as ideal as you would like it to be. So, you know, be bothered, use the tripod and get it right with the narrow lens aperture and the camera focus at, uh, at, its hyper, at the lens's hyperfocal distance. Okay, so now we move on to do something with telephoto lenses. And here, just simple shot taken uh, with a 300 mil lens uh, taken at f22. So the maximum depth of field that this lens will do, uh, focusing on my lovely partner's face, PP, and then the background is still pretty blurred, but it's quite busy. There's lots of vegetation in the background, and um, she, uh, her face still pops out of the background, but it's still quite, it's quite busy and distracting in the background there. If you reshoot to f4, lens aperture wide open, you see it's quite different. You, you might say in some ways that all the, these highlights, these light spots are actually a little bit distracting too, so in some instances, you might actually prefer that shot in some ways, but in this one, it, she really does pop out of the background. There is no detail there, but you do have these, these light spots of light bouncing off the vegetation behind her, which may be a little bit distracting in this particular instance. But you can see really the huge difference you have in the, in the focus and how much the background does blur out. And then we come to moving in close on a subject. This is not actually macro photography, it's just coming in closer with a, with a standard lens. And it's taken at f22. So even at f22, it's still, the background is still quite blurred. That's because we're coming in quite close. And as I said earlier, the depth of field starts to decrease even with a narrow lens aperture. But here you see that this fern frond is nice and sharp, but the background is fairly busy. It's quite complicated. If you reshoot at f4 with the lens aperture wide open, you can see that the background really completely falls away. Possibly overdone it slightly because even some of the, some parts of, the, of this fern frond are starting to go out of focus too. The lower half is nice and sharp, but the top half is starting to go as well. So maybe I should have uh, used a slightly narrower lens aperture to get at least these fern, these bits of the fern frond sharp as well. But um, to compare it again, so that's at f22. Background's okay, but it's quite busy. And then we go back go to f4. It's uh, it stands out much more from the background. Then we come in really to macro photography, uh, coming in really close with a, with a uh, macro lens to, onto a daylily. And I'm, I'm focusing the, the lens on these, the stamen here, these, these tubes. Uh, and this is an F22, so they've got the maximum depth of field that I can get. Most of the flower is also sharp, as you can see, except for the petal in the foreground, which goes blurred quite quickly. And then obviously the vegetation behind is, is rather blurred. If you do F, what are we doing next? If you do uh, F5.6, F5.6 you see the whole, much more of the picture blurs out. Most of the flower is blurred, and even so are some of the stamen. Even though they're very tight, tightly grouped, the depth of field is absolutely tiny, just a few millimeters. So go back again, that's F22. And that's f5.6. So it, it really depth of field at f5.6 is absolutely minute. And if I do a, a, a move on and do a little studio experiment this is with coins, this is f5.6. And you can see there's, there's, the two sets of coins are just a few centimeters apart. Depth of field is very small. This is taken with a macro lens again as well. And then at f22 very narrow lens aperture. The two sets of coins, are, but almost, the back set is almost sharp, but not quite. So it's a little bit disappointing in the sense that you would want to try and get those sets really sharp if you possibly could. So uh, the possible solution is, of course, uh, focus stacking, uh, which a lot of people sort of talk about as a, in, in computer solution, post photographic processing solution, which is you would take several pictures focused at different points through, through the view, all at the same lens aperture, and then you uh, blend them together in Photoshop afterwards. So I, I did an experiment there, did six images focused at different points in this, in this frame, and I'll show you them. It's the first one, f5.6. So the, all, all, all these six bit images are going to be f5.6. So just scroll through them. Six. So that's the six shots, and then we, we blend these, these six images together in the computer, and we end up with that. So you can see it's quite effective at getting these, these all six 
coins sharp. However, it's not quite as fantastic as you, as you might hope. There are some problems, there are some artifacts. If you look over here, it, the background is a little bit weird. And then you look here in the point where these two coins over, overlap. This, the uh, system hasn't quite worked out where the, where the difference between these two between the two coins are. So the focus stacking in Photoshop is is great, but it does have some problems and is is definitely prone to artifacts and it doesn't always work perfectly. I'm going to show you that again with this shot again. This back to this daylily F22, and then if I I do a whole series of shots. At, focusing at different planes in, in this, uh, of the flower and then I merged them together and we came up with this. Now I went through the, through the flower, I didn't bother with the background, so the background is pretty blurred. It's all, again, it's a whole series of six or seven shots all at f5.6, merged them together, the background stays blurred because I didn't, fo didn't focus on the background, but much more the much more of the flower is sharp than was possible with the, with the, with, uh, the original F5.6, but it's not perfect by long, long means. We've got quite a few artifacts, say up here at the top and over on the left here and down in the bottom right as well. They're not serious artifacts in the sense that they can be fixed to some extent in Photoshop by some work. And that's what I did in the end here with this final picture. This just trying to correct some of the artifacts that are built up so you can do some work in Photoshop if you want to do that. Personally, I, I always prefer to try and do things in camera if I possibly can. So I don't use focus, st focus stacking of multiple images uh, in this way to get a bigger depth of field. I don't do that very often because I do find artifacts creeping quite, quite a bit. Maybe I just need to practice more. I don't know. But that's, uh, I, I'm not it's not the, not the panacea for everything, but it, it but it can be quite useful. So that really is sort of the, sort of the story of of focusing in terms of how you would get sort of how you would consider different kinds of focusing for different sorts of images, from wide angle landscapes through to portraiture with a telephoto lens, through to macro photography, and then also uh, trying to do a little bit in post photography processing with stacked images. So finally, that's just the usual final final um, image. You can see quite a few things on the website as usual about photo galleries and the books and book photography courses. And now the, the recent addition uh, is you can now re, uh, put in reviews of photography services, not just of the books, but from photography services. So if you've been on a course and want to review one of my courses, you can do, or if you want to review these talks, you can do that as well. And to do that, you go on to the homepage, go to the, the contact us or contact uh, link at the top and then you, if the drop down menu comes down you'll find the, the, uh, the reviews so you can find those there and anybody who writes a review I'm giving a 10% discount coupon for the next few weeks it should be valid for half a year so if you want to do a review you'll get a 10% 10 discount off me. anyway so that's the end of, of this talk in terms of focus a bit of a whistle stop tour of focusing I have to say the next talk will be on the 24th of February and I'll be low light photography and I've chosen to do low light photography in the next talk because the first actual photography course of the spring is scheduled to be on March 21st and that will be low light photography. Heaven knows whether we'll be able to let it go ahead but uh, we, shall, uh, we shall see. Fingers crossed that we'll be able to do that 21st of March low light photography course. That next talk then will be 24th of February. So anyway I'm going to un I'm going to end the show and then I'm going to un, uh, uh, or stop sharing my screen. I'll do that up here. And then if you want to switch your microphones on and we can uh, do uh, have some questions and answers again, if you like. Thanks ever so much for that, Nigel. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Apologies, a little bit of a whistle stop, but uh, <laughs> uh, always, <laughs> there's always uh, more to say than um, that, that I can pack in usually. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Any questions? I don't think we've. I don't think we've got any questions. Have we? I've, got a, I've got a quick one. Is that Mark? Mike. Oh, Mike. Sorry, Mike. Where just are you? Just trying to turn my camera on. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, user user interface. Uh, yeah.
problem in chair, not in computer picnic. Yes, yeah, <laughs> the right lenses. Do you find um, that the extremes of the F numbers on any particular lens, you get a drop off in performance? Uh, so okay. Yeah. Go to go go to either end or not or. Yeah, a lot of it's true that a lot of uh, photography magazines recommend that you don't go to anything narrower than about f11, and I suspect that for a lot of lenses that may be true. For the lenses I use, which are the Canon L series lenses, it's it's not true. I can go up to f22 very easily without any drop off in quality. So uh, for the top, the highest quality lenses, it's not true. For lenses that are not quite such high quality, perhaps it it, it could well be true. At the other end, at very wide. Uh, very wide angle. Uh, yes, if you've got the lens after wide open, on certainly say on my 17 to 40 mil lens, even though it's an L series lens, I can get some vignetting, which is uh, darkening shading in the corners, which is easy enough to fix in in in, in, in the computer afterwards. But yes, so there is, there is a potential for some loss of quality with some lenses if you've got the lens after wide open as well. Yeah. Is there a solution if you get a problem at the uh, at the higher end, higher numbers? Uh, not that I know of, no, no. And I think that's so. If you're using a lens that doesn't perform well past f11, then I guess that's where focus stacking in uh, in Photoshop comes in, really. So, so if, you need, if you need a bigger depth of field than f11 can deliver. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask? Is it possible to pick up the previous two talks which I missed because I've only just discovered these oh right yeah uh, yes yeah. So all the all the talks are uh, pre all the previous talks are on the website if you go to nigelhicks.com and then go to the uh, the talk section you'll find all, all the uh, videos of all the previous talks yes thank you uh, this one will get there the next week I'm sure anybody oh. else yeah, hi, Nigel. It's Anne Dolby. Could I ask you a question? Certainly. Um, it was about your image with the um, moving water and the leaves. Ah, yes, okay. So I presume that you focused on the leaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then did you use a filter so that you could then do a longer exposure? No, no, it's, uh, it's um, in Woodland on a rather cloudy day. So the f16 is quite a narrow lens aperture of course so the shutter speed was pretty slow anyway uh, oh, I, I haven't got it written down here what it was but it would have been probably a second or half a second something like that so light levels yeah. were quite low so the, the, the water inevitably blurred okay okay mm -hmm. I see I'm Lawrence making notes there Sorry. Nigel, on the subject of uh, oh, yeah, right. some of the cheaper lenses not being very good, mm -hmm. I use DxO Optics. Right. The lens correction tool is brilliant. Yes, thanks for reminding me of that. I mean, obviously, um, in a lot of um, uh, post photography software now, there, there are uh, correction tools for a lot of uh, lenses now. That's very true. Whether it would correct that issue, I, guess, I, I don't know. I have not, not, uh, not tried it out, but certainly in terms of um, you have uh, chromatic aberration and so on is quite a common issue with a lot of lenses and, and you will find that most uh, image processing softwares now have built into them a lot of correct correction factors for a lot of lenses. Especially where something mm. goes soft at the edges, it sharpens the edges up very well. Yes, that's true. If, you, if the, if the, if the um, if it's just the center of the picture is sharp and then it goes off a bit towards this edge, you can, you, that can be improved. That's very true. I forget that because I have, always have it automatically switched on on my uh, image processing software. So it just does it automatically without me having to think too much about it. <laughs> so. That's with Photoshop? No, that's with uh, Capture One Pro. Oh, right. I've never tried yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it's extremely good for raw conversion. And they say it has all these... Um, uh, lens correction factors uh, embedded in, in there. It means that I don't sharpen the pictures at all. Okay, yeah. No, I very often don't need to as well. Sometimes I do, but not, not, not all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else want to ask something or anything? No, if, uh, if there's nobody else has got any questions, then I'll uh, just we'll close the meeting here.
and thanks for coming along everybody um i hope that uh, you've enjoyed it so it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of of, of focus but uh, hopefully it'll give you something to go out and practice i know it's locked down at the moment but you can still practice sort of fairly close to home uh, away from the crowds and carry on taking your pictures it's good for your health you know like just getting out and taking pictures uh, and doing something so it's uh, not just escaping covid but keeping your keeping your mind and body active in other way in other ways to actually protect your health generally so um next talk 24th of february uh, obviously if you want to come along a lot of people a lot of you have already registered for that talk if uh, if you haven't done so as yet and want to do so then just carry on obviously i'll be sending out reminders later anyway so okay so, Hi, Joel. Good i just finished talking thank you very much for joining me thank and, you. Uh, we'll see you again